Bruises by the Blackburn Highway along the coast of Kingstown Bay. Inevitably, travelers drive by just parallel to this site that has over time become so familiar, so unnoticed, so apparently forgotten. Against the indifferent march of time and the unrelenting force of nature, these ruins still remain at the bottom of Kingstown Hill. Obviously fragile now, yet strangely defiant. As we drive past these ruins, what are they telling us of our living history? What do they represent? Is there room for this place in our collective consciousness? As we go by today and plan for tomorrow, why should we remember this place anyway? And so there was enormous resistance to genuinely accommodating them. And let's remember that the planters and the middle class that they had created were really the only people who could afford to employ anybody. So that in fact, the Africans who had been brought in on the ships between 1811 and 1821 did have rough socioeconomic circumstances in which to try to earn their existence. And so uh, the British king, decided that the British Crown would have to find some particular piece of land on Tortola that could be given to those Africans. Mrs. Dix, a white woman whose husband had died, leaving her in possession of at least 20 liberated Africans, hired them out on St. Thomas. They were said to earn her, quote, a piece of eight of Danish money, end of quote, or about two shillings, six pence sterling per day. Indeed, after the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, many in poor circumstances, black and white, saw the free Africans as their last opportunity to obtain free labor and as their ticket to financial solvency. One woman, described as a, quote, female pauper, wanted to obtain, quote, an apprentice from whose labor she thought she could derive great advantage, end of quote. Everybody wanted to cash in on the labor of blacks.
built this church with their own labor and with the materials available to them. And we see in the way in which the, the church was built, it was built in the same, the same sort of materials as used in the sugar factories at the time, which was local rock, a ballast brick, and certain trimmings and details cut out of a coral which would have been harvested from the bay um, in, in front of me here now. <clears throat> this was easy to carve when it was fresh out of the water uh, and then it hardened on exposure to air. The mortar that would have been used here would have been sand from the beach and also we had uh, mixed with a lime which is burnt from the same coral and uh, the building was originally all plastered. Time went on again, the church went into disrepair. In fact, in 1924, the church roof was taken from St. Philip's to be put on St. George's because the hurricanes had done damage here. And that, that be, began the, the, the ruin of, of St. Philip's in a sense because since then, that roof has not uh, been put back. And when the Cedar School was building, the work from driving the piles over there again affected the stability of the walls there. And since then, we have had to shore up those walls with some wooden planks as that you see there at present. Significance of this church, the history surrounding it, the period in which it belongs, is a significant piece of history for our young people to learn today. Um, it's unique to the Virgin Islands, first of all, and it certainly gives them a perspective of what their ancestors went through, um, what happened during that period, and it is important that they understand this because. As we always say in history, for us to go forward, we have to understand our past. And in understanding our past, then we will be able to better plan for the future and to prevent some of the things that happen, some of the things that we have come to hate in our history, some of the things that we are afraid to talk about. And in learning history, that is important for us to, to know and to understand. Um, and it's something that we don't often delve into with our young people, but it is important for them to to learn the difficulties, to learn the harshness of the history, to understand their past in going forward. We have a situation here where we've had serious deterioration on the fabric. I've known this building, I've owned adjoining land for 35 years. Uh, we've had, the building has survived earthquakes and piling on a structure across the street, which did further damage to it. Um, so what we are hoping to do now is to get enough funds to rehabilitate the structure. That would be consolidating the existing walls. This facade here, we would be totally rehabilitating, rebuilding, and the one at the other end of the church, rebuilding the lintels, and the gable end, and we'd be restoring the cut coral 
window sills and other details like that. And instead of and putting in hardwood uh, lintels over the openings. The sequence of how we're going to carry out the rehabilitation work on, on St. Philip's is as follows. First of all, we had a very good start by having this shoring put in. The next thing we need to do here is to clean up around the, the church and remove from the walls all the vegetation because they are, the roots are breaking the walls apart even further. After that, we will consolidate the building as you see it by repointing in, the, in appropriate places with a lime-based mortar, which we will have scientifically made to match exactly the mortar we have here so we don't break it apart. We cannot use Portland cement. We will also restore this facade in its entirety with lintels and stonework and everything else. When we have then completed that work, uh, we will, when funds permit, put along on each side the piers for the canopy, the timber canopy, which will go over the church and above it. Those piers will have foundations which will be put in with a helical screw plate driven into, turned down into the ground so that we don't have to do any major excavation in this consecrated ground which is also a cemetery. I don't believe that we've done enough with our historical sites in the territory and I think that the the African location the church that's there is is one of our greatest historical sites it, it, it says something about who we are as a people and who who we become and the past from which we came so I, I think it's important that, that it remain in our consciousness and how, how do we do that I think by not just having a church service there every year and, and not sort of investigating some of the other issues surrounding the free Africans who came here and the lives that they, they, they led I think it's important that we also investigate perhaps um, open the area up, do an archaeological dig, you know, find out what, what's actually de there in terms of, of, of how the people lived, the, the implements that they used, um, you know, the, the, the things that they may have left behind. I, I, I think that's really important. I think that making the focus, making the, the church perhaps the focus of future uh, investigations, future discussions about slavery, and about the free Africans themselves and, and what that said about the whole um, uh, movement towards abolition and, and so on. I, I think that's important and it, it can be a sort of living reminder, particularly if we do the, the archaeological dig and we keep it open as an ongoing exploration of our past. I, I think it can really make our history alive and alive for not just for ourselves but also for future generations. So when we look at historical sites, and I'd like to focus on, on that in particular, when we look at historical sites, we have a very small representation of the diversity of history, if you may, represented in the protected area system. And that is in part because, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of those properties are owned um, by, by individuals. You can uh, try to buy uh, land and try to make those properties eventually part of the national park system. Well, in a lot of cases, those opportunities are not going to be there. People may not necessarily be willing to sell their land. They may have a, um, a, an emotional attachment to not only the land, but also to the features that they may have. And economically, it may not be feasible to just simply buy everything that um, you may want to. And, and really and truly, you may not want to do that. Some of the other alternatives available to the territory in terms of ways in which we can conserve, preserve, ensure that there are representative examples of historical features of, of significance to our history. You may want to enter into collaborative relationships, cooperative relationships with indiv individual landowners who may have significant um, historical holdings on their property and who may be willing 
to engage in this kind of activity in terms of ensuring that um, notwithstanding the fact that they may want to develop their land, they may want to do things to ensure that the, the ruins, the um, historical features on their land are either stabilized, restored, and which can be properly displayed and um, properly available and, and made available to the public for greater understanding and for a better appreciation of, of our heritage. To that avail, uh, the trust in particular, um, as part of its revision of the principal act, the ordinance, the laws that govern uh, how we do things, one of the things that we introduced was this concept of what is really now a conservation agreement. And a conservation agreement, in very simple terms, is a voluntary agreement that can be entered between any landowner, the trust, and government to, first of all, demarcate the um, property uh, and the features that may be important for conservation. The act and the, especially the conservation agreement, allow for um, negotiation really to take place between various parties to derive benefit on both sides, on all sides really. There's so much history in, 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 in this little plot of land that we are trying our best to see how we can preserve the existing walls to be part of any new thrust to, to preserve the, the church. For it is easy to think that we could just pull down the walls and build back in the same space. But uh, those who are interested in, in really preservation would, would have serious problems with that. In fact, what they require of us is to try to get the sort of expert expertise in this field to, to preserve what is there and, and to include it in any new structure. The hope is that we can restore this site as we reflect on the work done by the liberated Africans to put a church on this site in the first place, to remember their joys of fulfilling this noble endeavor to construct such a church, the first for freed blacks in the Americas. And we pray that we will get the kind of support from all agencies to make this a reality and for St. Philip's to have another lease on life in, in this part of the vineyard. Restoring this um, church there at Kingston that the Free Africans established is an excellent idea. Um, the African Studies Club, you know, based on our objectives, uh, is is completely in agreement with restoring this this settlement or the, this institution or the structure of the building. We're in complete agreement with that. The reason for this is we believe that our people here in the Virgin Islands and throughout the diaspora and even the continent of Africa itself have to revisit the question of, of our enslavement and the, the question of our separation from the continent of Africa and this whole process that we've been through. We do not believe that our people have fully healed from this experience that we've undertook over the last um, few centuries where our auto autonomy and our independence was taken away from us. Um, we have this whole uh, concept of reparations. And reparations being repairing the relationship that, that, um, between different nations. We do not believe that we can truly repair the damage that's been done um, through this horrific experience until we actually revisit 
um, basically the, the incident or the transgression that was done. And in restoring the church, it get, provides an opportunity for us to re, uh, revisit that um, period of time in history. And also, not just revisit it, but also provide some solutions or provide some ways of healing that our people can come to grips and to cope with this reality of being enslaved. And so restoring it, I would um, really prefer to see that in its restoration that it has a functional use in today's society that can serve um, firstly for healing or informing our people of what, has done, what, what was done to us and what type of um, life we were able to fashion out for ourselves here in the Virgin Islands.